Welcome in. Today, uh, we're diving into a life story. And honestly, it's like uncovering, you know, one of those old mixtapes. We've got these memoir excerpts, super interesting. But then, boom, song lyrics scattered everywhere. Wow, yeah. It's like we're getting the events, Andy, the soundtrack of his life all in one. That's a really cool way to put it. So I'm curious, what about this particular story made you want to dive in? Honestly, I think it's the chance to see a life through both those lives. You know, the memoir is like the external narrative, the stuff that happened, but then those song lyrics. It's like a peek inside his head. Exactly. His emotions, what he was going through at the time. You don't get that combo very often. It's true. It's like we're piecing together this puzzle and it all starts, get this, 1961, New Bedford, Massachusetts. Our guy is born into this huge Irish Catholic family, eight siblings. I can't even imagine the dinner conversations. He even talks about like, singing in the car on those classic family road trips. Talk about early musical influences. For sure. And, you know, it wasn't just family. This is the 60s. Huge cultural shifts, music changing like crazy. Totally. And he was right in the middle of it. He mentions a close bond with his grandfather, who was a musician himself. Makes you wonder how much that shaped his own musical, I don't know, like his path. It makes you think, right? And get this, we've actually got some lyrics right here from that time. I grew up in the 60s, a time of violence and hate. I grew up wide-eyed, never looking back. Sometimes it felt like a heart attack. By my side, by my side. Angels by my side. Heavy stuff. Wow. That's, uh, sometimes it felt like a heart attack. That's powerful. Even for, I mean, imagine being a kid feeling that intensely. Right. And he's surrounded by family, all this new music, but there's something more there, right? Like a depth to his feelings. You can sense it. It's true. You don't always see that kind of sensitivity, especially at that age. It makes you wonder. And it wasn't all, you know, sunshine and roses. He talks about having trouble with his vision really early on, even being labeled a kindergarten dropout because he had to wear an eye patch. I wore an eye patch as a kid, and let me tell you. It's not not a good look. You stand out for all the wrong reasons. Definitely. I mean, everyone wants to fit in, right? Uh But when there's something visible like that, especially as a kid, it really gets in your head. You start wondering, am I different? Am I less than? Makes you resilient. But... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But those scars, they stick with you. And it seems like that feeling of being different, maybe it even got stronger when his family moved to Westport in 1970. Big change, bustling city to a more rural vibe. He says it's the first time he really experienced prejudice. Yeah. There's this incident at a basketball game that he talks about. It really stuck with him. It's a big moment in the memoir. He doesn't just tell you what happened. He really reflects on it. How it made him face that ugliness head on, you know, the prejudice. And his own part in it. Exactly. Not easy lessons for anyone, let alone a young guy in a new place trying to figure it all out. He could have just brushed it off, you know, just some dumb comment in the heat of the moment. But he doesn't. He carries it with him. That's big. Totally. Shows real self-awareness. To be willing to confront those uncomfortable truths about himself, the world. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Makes you wonder if that's what sparked that empathy he seems to have, you know? It's possible. Early experiences can really shape you. And right in the middle of all this change, he's finding his people, finding his sound. He talks about starting a neighborhood gang, though it sounds more like a group of friends. And guess what? They were going to early Aerosmith concerts. Not a cow. Talk about being in the right place at the right time. Seriously, that raw energy a band about to blow up. Those shows get in your soul. For sure. It's more than just the music, you know. Yeah. It's like belonging, being part of something bigger. And just as he's figuring out this whole adolescence thing, bam, near fatal car crash, someone crashes into him. This rush with mortality, as he calls it, it's like right on the edge of adulthood. Wow. Talk about a life changer. It's got to make you look at everything differently, right? To face death that young. He even says he felt God's presence at the moment of impact. Intense. Really makes you think about what people cling to in those moments, those moments of pure terror. Makes you think about, I don't know, like your own mortality, you know? Oh, totally. Like you're just cruising along, feeling like nothing can stop you, and then... Snap your fingers. Exactly. It makes you wonder if that experience, maybe that's what pushed him toward adventure, this need to really live, you know? Could be. Some people run from that feeling. But it seems like he ran towards it. Because from there, it's like he jumps headfirst into this whirlwind of journeys. We're talking cross-country train trip, sailing down to Florida, even spend some time in California. Wow, the guy was busy. It's like he was searching for something, constantly on the move. 
Or maybe he was searching for himself in all those experiences. Hmm. There's this line in the memoir that's beautiful, but really talks about watching the world fly by from that train window. And he says, it was like the scenery was changing inside of me too. Wow. Right? Speaks to that internal shift that can happen when you step outside your comfort zone. No question. And he was definitely way outside his comfort zone with that sailing trip. He and this guy, Chris, they decide to build a sailboat from scratch, 36 feet long. You're kidding. I'm serious. 36 feet. You'd have to be, I don't know, a little bit crazy to even try that. A little bit crazy, a lot brave. It reminds me of how he built his own house later on. Always building, always tinkering, always figuring things out. That's true. He never shied away from a challenge. Remember those lyrics? Sometimes it felt like a heart attack. I yeah. feel like that was his comfort zone. Right. He needs that intensity to feel fully alive. It's a constant throughout his life. Absolutely. But even he had to admit life isn't always smooth sailing. He gets into this thing in Norfolk, Virginia, ends up spending the night in jail. Some kind of misunderstanding with the police, but still. Oof. Reality check. Right. Like a reminder that actions have consequences. You can't outrun everything no matter how much you try. It's like that moment when Icarus flies too close to the sun, you know. Exactly. Makes you wonder, did that experience change him? Did he become more cautious or did it just make him even more sure that he had to live life on his own terms? It's hard to say for sure, but we know he ends up back in Massachusetts soon after. And it's not just because it's home. His parents are going through this nasty public divorce, and he wants to be there for his family. Family pulls you back in. Always, no matter how far you roam. And just when it seems like he might be settling down, he meets Christina. And their story is really interesting. He's drawn to her in this way he wasn't with other women. She's calmer, more of an artist. Total opposite of his impulsive energy. Totally. And it's like she brings out this different side of him, this desire to be more grounded, more steady. He even says she made him want to be a better man, more patient, more understanding. That's beautiful. It is. And they build this whole life together. He dives headfirst into work selling computers at the start of the PC revolution. Can you imagine? Wild. Like the Wild West, but with floppy disks and dial-up. Right. And he's thriving in that world, a natural salesman. But even more than that, he's genuinely stoked about this technology. It's that adaptability, that ability to reinvent himself. He's not afraid of change. If anything, he runs towards it. Totally. But even with this crazy career, starting a family, he never gives up on music. He buys a Taylor guitar, starts writing songs again. It's like that passion never really left. Just... Dormant. Yeah, maybe. But it makes you think. Those things that light us up, the things that make us feel truly alive, we find our way back to them. We do. It's like this underlying current, always there, even when we think it's gone. It's a powerful thought, but it also makes you think about the choices we make. Did he find that true sense of fulfillment? You know, the career, the family, the house he literally built himself. The American dream. Yeah. But then there are those song lyrics. They make you wonder if a part of him was still searching like maybe something was missing it's the question isn't it can you really have it all but then what does that even mean you know right like what does having it all even look like everyone's got their own version mm -hmm. and i think the story it really shows that like he builds this picture perfect life but, yeah. but whose picture is it really I exactly and you can feel that in the lyrics especially later on he even mentions a potential divorce doesn't dwell on it but you can tell it shook him big time yeah. And the song lyrics from that time, they hit different. He writes, It's not easy being in a crowd. Everybody talks so damn loud. It's so easy to lose your way. Find your exit or there you'll stay. Man. Heavy. You can almost hear the frustration in his voice. You know, like he's desperate for something real, something authentic. It's like he's trying to find his own voice again amidst all that noise. And maybe that's what this whole journey was really about all along. That search for self-expression whether it's through music or adventure or even just those quiet moments where he seems to find himself again. Because life, it's not a straight line, is it? Hmm. There are going to be detours, wrong turns, pit stops you never expected. He goes from building sailboats to selling PCs to figuring out marriage and fatherhood. It's a lot. It is. But yeah. each experience, even the tough ones, they shape him, right? Like mm -hmm. push him a little closer to figuring out who he is and what he's about. And isn't that what we're all doing, really? Truth. Yeah. But it makes you think, what happens next? What does that next chapter look like for him? Does he find that musical spark again? He does mention a Taylor Swift connection. Remember how he gets that Taylor guitar? Well, apparently she plays a Coalwood Taylor too, just like his. It's a small detail, but I thought it was interesting. 
I like that he put that in there. It's like this little wink, you know, like, hey, the music's still there. Exactly. You know, I got to say, I'm rooting for this guy. I hope he finds that peace, that sense of truly belonging, whether it's on a stage or just in his own skin, you know. Me too. And that's what makes a story really stick with you, right? When it stays with you long after you've finished it, leaves you with questions. Makes you think about your own life. Exactly. Your own choice is what you're searching for. So... As we come to the surface on this deep dive, I'm curious, what parts of his story really resonated with you? Yeah, what felt familiar? Did anything spark a memory or two? And what about his journey? What can we learn from his ups and downs, those adventures, that constant pull back to music? Because I think it reminds us that life isn't about having all the answers, right? It's about taking the journey with all its messy beauty, its unexpected turns. And who knows, maybe that's where we find the most beautiful music of all.